Hello, everyone. We're live and recording. Now, it is my pleasure this Friday evening to bring to you Lily Vale, who is in the center of our three screens. And we are celebrating the shoddy setup. A very, very, very big, big round of applause. Now, the shoddy setup came out this week. So if you are looking for some happiness and goodness in your life, you have come to the right place and you are at the right event. There's even cute dogs on the cover. Like, does it, it just look at that. It's just so, oh, it, it's got all the feels. And I am excited because Lily's going to be in conversation with Maisie Eddings, who is on the opposite side. There we go. The waving is much more helpful than my pointing. <laughs> and just to give you a little intro into the authors, Lily is the author of the young adult novel, Small Town Hearts. She writes about secrets and yearning, complicated and ambitious girls who know what they want, which gets like a big like hell yeah from us. Um, <laughs> the places we call home and people we find our way back to and the magic we make. Like what more could you ask for in, in a book? Um, she was born in Mumbai and she grew up in Mississippi, Texas and North Dakota and now lives in an Indiana college town. And the shoddy setup is actually her debut adult novel, which is super exciting. And then Maisie is a neurodiverse author, dentist, and most importantly, stage mom to her cats, which I have much respect for, um, <laughs> who are Yaya and Zadie. And she can most often be found reading romance novels under her weighted blanket and asking her boyfriend to bring her snacks exactly how it should be. Uh, <laughs> made it her personal mission in life to destigmatize mental health issues and write love stories for every brain, which is something we really, really appreciate and are glad that you're doing. With roots in Ohio and North Carolina, she now calls Philadelphia home. And her debut novel was A Brush with Love, which is published by St. Martin's Press. Now, the house rules before I pass it off to our authors. If you look to the right-hand side, hello, Ryan, hooray back at you. That is indeed the chat section. If you would like to say hello, chat, shed love for these amazing books, go ahead and do that there. If you have any questions, if you look down below, there will be a beautiful button that says, ask a question as indeed it would imply that is where you ask a question. I highly encourage you to do that. Author events are fun because you really get to ask them about their writing process, the book, what inspired them, all those fun little details. And also the best way to support an author, you know it's coming when their book has come out is the purchase book button right down below. So if you would like to purchase the shoddy setup, make sure you click that button and you will get a custom designed signed book plate, which is really, really snazzy. So on that note, I'm going to pass it off. Oh, yay! Oh, I didn't I I have a dog! Oh my gosh, it's so full circle. It has a doggy on it. So I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to Lily and Maisie. Thank you all so much. And I will see you at the end of the event. Bye! Bye, Constant. Lily, congratulations on an incredible release week. How has the week been for you? It has been really great. It's been a whirlwind. It's been so much fun seeing everyone come out with so much support for the book. I just, I, I love it. Like, it, it, this last year has been, like, really difficult for, like, a lot of really self-evident reasons. And also, like, just writing a book is hard. So it's really great to like celebrate that. And I've had a great week with really great events with a lot of really cool bookstores. And, and um, I'm really excited that my final event of the night and of the entire week is gonna end with um, talking with you here at Mysterious Galaxy. Yeah, I'm so excited. So um, if you want, give us like a quick synopsis or overview of the book. It's so good. One of my favorite reads of 2021. I love it so much. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I'm a writer, so I can never be like too brief about anything. So I <laughs> and this is a little bit long winded. <laughs> so yeah, um, this is a book, The Shoddy Setup. It is a slow burn exes to lovers, second chance romance. Yes, I am throwing a bunch of tropes at you right off the bat because I know, you know, romance readers, they know what they want. Um, it's between a furniture restorer called Rita Chitness and her high school sweetheart, Milan Rao, who happens to be the boy who broke her heart six years ago. She's currently dating a new guy at the start of the book called Neil. Things aren't perfect. There's a few yellow flags along the way that she's conveniently ignoring. And, <laughs> <laughs> and 
and things are good enough for right now. Like she's just interested in having fun and seeing where things go. And she's not really thinking about anything uh, long-term with him. And her mom, not knowing that she's dating this guy, sets her up with her ex, Milan, who is now a real estate agent. And she volunteers Rita's uh, furniture design and restoration and interior design skills to help him sell a really difficult listing. Rita is like convinced that there's no way her mom knows what's best for her, you know, as kids usually, as the kids usually do. And, you know, Milan, he walks back into her life six years later and like, he's not mad about seeing her. He's really into it. Like he's flirty, <laughs> he's, flirty he's attractive. <laughs> He, he's, he's had a glow up basically. And he is like a, a top shelf snack right now. And <laughs> <laughs> so she comes up with this plan to prove that she's not into him anymore at all. And to prove to her mom that there's no way Milan is in any way her perfect match anymore. And her mom is like a really big believer in second chances. And Rita kind of wants to pop that bubble. Not in a mean way, more like yeah. in I'm an independent, uh, modern day woman. I don't need help finding a man. So she signs herself and her current boyfriend up on a website called My Shoddy, which is an Indian matchmaking site. And it's very reputable. It's very like legit. It always comes up with like the perfect matches for couples. So she thinks that if she matches with her current boyfriend, Neil, it's going to prove to everyone, it's going to validate what she believes that she and Milan are no longer like a perfect match. Unfortunately, in true rom-com fashion, um, those are famous last words, and she does not get the validation she wants. And she matches with the last guy she ever expected, who happens to be Milan. And now they're forced to like work together in this professional partnership, flipping this house on the fictional Rosalie Island, which I set off the coast of New Bern um, in North Carolina, beautiful North Carolina. And they kind of have to find their way back to each other in the course of the novel and kind of figure out what really happened six years ago to break them up. Oh, and Lily, I just gotta say, like this book, I was laughing, I was like tearing up. You just, you hit every beat so beautifully. Oh, I just you. adore it. And so you did start off with all the tropes and you did such a great job, like merging a lot that we don't see together necessarily. And so I was wondering like, was one particularly fun for you to write or like do you have a favorite trope to write? You know what? I hadn't really entered a book thinking about like what tropes I wanted to include right off the bat before. This is the first time I did it in a very intentional way. Um, so like I said, it's slow burn, it's exes to lovers, it's a second chance. And some of the others, which I didn't necessarily mention, but are kind of self-evident from what I talked about, is uh, forced proximity, first love. And I don't know if it's a trope. It's, pr it's probably not. But I mean, Look at how cute these dogs are. Like I know. They're so, so cute. I like puppies should be a trope. Because I mean, these two do a lot of work to bring our two kids together. So So much like work. Like Freddie <laughs> literally just like carries them, I feel like. <laughs> I don't know how Rita has to carry him because he doesn't want to go yeah. on a walk. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, no, Freddie owns my heart. Like Milan is a book boyfriend, but Freddie is like a book bulldog boyfriend. <laughs> like I was just obsessed with him. Yeah. Um, and so Rita is just like this superstar furniture renovation guru. And so what was the research like for you to write her character and like the things that she creates and things like that? What was that process like? Yeah, so actually um, I've got this question a lot like about the research that went into the book. And like, the thing is, all the research happened like before I even had like the kernel of an idea for this book, um, because at the beginning of the pandemic, which was before I even started writing this book, before I even had that idea, I was watching a lot of like HGTV. I was watching like all those house flipping shows like House Hunters um, International, House Hunters, Love It or List It, Flip or Flop, um, some of the Chip and Joanna Gaines ones. And when I kind of exhausted mm -hmm. all of those, and, and there are a lot, believe me, um, I went on to something called Flea Market Flip, which is something I'd never heard about before, but it's basically a show where people are competing to upcycle something from like a flea market and upcycle it into something new and beautiful. And I, I just love that theme of taking something kind of unloved and broken and busted and making it something beautiful. Um, it's like the literal um, finding like treasure out of trash or whatever that, however that saying goes. And I really wanted a character who did that for a living because I just feel like it's so inventive, so creative 
And then of course I went down that like rabbit hole on YouTube um, where like one video led to another. And I, I wound up with like a whole bunch of useless information about like band saws and like the right kind <laughs> of brain and like all these like useless facts about like a whole bunch of stuff that didn't even make their way into the book. Cause it's like way too technical, dry and boring for a reader. And um, in full disclosure, like I can't do like any of what Rita does <laughs> for paint and like arrange things on bookshelves. So it was just really fun for me, you know, to kind of imagine the things I would love to do or I would love to make. And like that show, like I, I even acknowledged it in my um, actual acknowledgements in the book that, you know, thank you to Flea Market Flip for being such an inspiration. <laughs> Yeah, and I loved, like, I, I mean, I just thought it was such beautiful symbolism how Rita is constantly, like, rehabbing unloved products and or unloved, like, furniture or things like that. And then she rehabs her love with Milan. Just, I, yeah, I love that whole arc. I thought that was so beautiful. Um, and the other side of Rita, I mean, like, I just adored Rita. I thought she was so, like, complex and nuanced and, like, really just she really epitomized like a modern woman in, in, in my eyes and everything like that. But one thing that just had me like head over heels for her was her cooking and like, her con and I have heard so many people bring up the Mac masala. So do you want to like talk about some of the food in the book that you are just serving us? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like I feel like the book should come with a like, disclaimer on it that says warning, this book will make you really hungry. So like you better have something delicious to eat. Otherwise you're going to be angry that you don't have anything yummy while you read it. A hundred percent. Like I was like, oh my God. I was just like, I was gorging while I was eating. I was like, none of this looks as good as what Rita's eating right now. I want to read a cookbook. So like if we could get that in the next iteration. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I wish. Like I've got like so many people asking me for like the recipes in the book and like just saying that they love it and they love all the foodiness of it. And like foodiness is something I really enjoy writing in books. And I feel like it's sort of like my unofficial brand because even my first book was all about like baking and these very like elaborate, like 20, 30 step um, processes that <laughs> I found really fascinating. But again, you know, um, I am not very crafty. These hands are for typing only. I <laughs> so like, I don't even really bake that much. But like when I say I bake, unless I um, clarify that with, I baked from scratch. You can bet it's like one of those old very cookies, <laughs> like those take and bake sheets, which like, yeah. oh, really, yeah. I'm really looking forward to the Pillsbury little pumpkin ones coming out. <laughs> yes, a hundred percent. I mean, that is the mark of spooky season. <laughs> I feel like we should get you a t-shirt that says like these hands were made for typing. <laughs> like that is so fun. Um, and so also, like within the book, so you have lived kind of all over, but you set the book in North Carolina. Have you ever spent any time living there? Because you captured it so well. Oh, have you been there before? I went to college there. Yeah, oh, I'm actually wow. there right now. <laughs> oh my gosh, I had no clue. I didn't know that's where you were. Yeah, well, I'm here visiting my, my mom. So it was just like coincidence. But yeah, I went to college in North Carolina. Oh, I love that. No, I've never been there myself. And you know what? At the beginning of the pandemic, I was actually planning a trip, which unfortunately got kind of like thrown to the wayside after that. But I mean, I was not going to give up. I was definitely going to go there somehow. And I did via. <laughs> <laughs> Do you like how it just slid in there? I know. <laughs> cool. <laughs> um, it, so yeah, um, I couldn't get on a plane or anything. So I armchair traveled with these hands and this, this keyboard and I went to North Carolina through, vicariously through Rita. <laughs> you, I mean, you really did like your Zaxby's mentions and Bojangles. I was like, oh my God, I, I had to Google it at first. I was like, does she live in North Carolina? Like this is amazing. So I really, like you did such a fun job with it and the humidity, you really captured that well. Like <laughs> Rita is a sweaty girl and I felt that deep in my soul because I am um so obviously this book was like a product of the pandemic right like you wrote it through which yeah. kudos to you like that's incredible um and that right there deserves like all the right author awards but what would be Rita and Milan's um quarantine hobbies like what would they have taken up or like <laughs> odd obscure things that they would have gotten really into 
Okay, so this is a really interesting question that I haven't got yet. So big kudos to you for asking <laughs> that like no one has asked me yet. And I mean, it's been a long week with a ton of events. So believe me, I have been asked a lot of stuff. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah, so I think Rita would definitely try to coax Milan into doing a lot of stuff around the house. And I feel like Milan would probably like resist a little bit. Because like even even in the book, like she's the one doing a lot of the work, like the heavy lifting, and he's like shirtless and playing with her dogs. <laughs> I was gonna say, I bet he's shirtless. Whatever he's doing, like Milan is shirtless through quarantine. <laughs> yeah, he's definitely not wearing a shirt, and he's playing with her dogs. But unlike Neil, when it comes to being in the kitchen, he is definitely like in there cooking with her, um, chopping, being cute and probably doing the dishes too like that was really important i wanted to show that like he fully believes in like helping out and like in the book he's there making her like the perfect scrambled eggs just the way she likes it he makes her coffee and he like washes up and everything after i know he wipes down the table and i was like what's sexier than that when he when he like got her plate because he finished first and then he like he was like, oh, I got it. And he washed it. I was like, this, this book is a masterpiece. Like it's everything I've ever wanted. Like competency porn, 100% of the way. Okay, that, that needs to be a real thing. And I want to see, oh. I, I want to see more of it. T truly, like if anything needs to become like a really common trope, competency porn is like the number one and just doing dishes in general, like very important to, so, to all of us. Did you mean that or? No, 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 I've heard that from somewhere. Yeah, I, I did not. I wish I was clever enough to have come up with that. But like, I've heard it on like bookstagram or something like that. But yeah, I mean, we need it in every book. I feel like. Definitely. We need a lot more of it. <laughs> um, and then what was like, so besides, or maybe it was this, but like, what was your favorite scene to write um, in the book? And then did you have like, one that was super frustrating to get through. And if this is too spoily, we don't have to go there, but I was just like wondering how you felt about different aspects of it. Yeah, so um, without getting too spoilery, I'll just, um, I'll, just, I'll stick with something that was in the beginning of the book, which is a scene where Rita and Milan come face to face again for the first time. And this was actually probably my favorite scene, but also the most frustrating. So mm -hmm. you're getting a two for one there. Um, <laughs> um, so, he shows up at her door, kind of like he ambushes her, although he does, he has no clue she's gonna be there. And she's really surprised when she sees who it is. Her first instinct is to hide, but she <laughs> can't because her mom like swans out looking like very composed and like this is not at all out of the ordinary because hint, hint, she's the one who arranged it. And she's like, don't leave that poor boy standing out there in this heat, Rita. Like what are you doing <laughs> and offer him a drink? Like, thanks, mom, for betraying me. <laughs> so, you know, she opens the door, welcomes him in, and it's really super awkward because Rita is sweaty. She, like, <laughs> like, you know, as you mentioned, she's wearing this, like, ratty black T-shirt. It's covered in dog hair. Like, her scalp is sweaty. Like, everything is sweaty. And she's really embarrassed. But, like, Milan is, like, blowed up. He's looking amazing. She's still very attracted to him. And it's like this very awkward like cocktail of emotions where she still has this grudge against him for what she thinks he did to break them up six years ago. But at the same time, it's like she can't deny how into him she still is, partly because she never quite got un for out from under him in a way. Yeah. <laughs> and, and like he's just there suave, sophisticated and, you know, unfairly attractive while she's feeling like very less than right now in this moment because you know you, everyone has this fantasy of like when you see your ex again after a long time you've got to look top dead like gorgeous like you've got to look killer you've got to bring your yeah. a game so and i mean that's like a really fun scene because i feel like that had a lot of like horrific elements that would <laughs> happen in real life like you like this this would be my worst nightmare basically um, oh, and, 100%. Or, or one of them, or one of them anyway. Um, I, I, I'm anxious, so I have a lot of like nightmares. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, so I feel it was also one of the most frustrating for the same reason because it's also very difficult to capture like all that emotion that happened like off the page in the past and make your reader feel like very um, attuned to it in the present mm -hmm. where it's actually happening. 
And I mean, I hope I did a good job with that. And like, like mer merging the two, um, merging the two versions of them and like what she was feeling from back then has kind of all just come rushing to the forefront because she has been stamping their past down with a vengeance. Like she, she <laughs> needed about it. Like she's trying to pretend like, oh, I'm over him. I'm dating this new guy, blah, 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 blah. But it's like pretty obvious, you know, maybe to everyone around her and to us as the reader that things are not as they appear. It, you, I really do think that you captured it so well because like there are so many complex feelings with that and you just really nailed it because like, I, one thing that sticks out about that scene too is like when she flips her hair over and like, you know, judges it up and everything. Yeah. And I'm like, because it's like, you know, on one hand she wants to be like, whatever, I don't care. Like, but then on the other hand, she's like, okay, but damn, at least gotta get my hair like looking good. <laughs> See this guy again, cause he's looking so gorgeous. It's ridiculous. Um, and one thing that I thought you did so well too is it's like a very human experience to kind of like get in your own way with relationships that you want to pursue or that like part of you wants to pursue and then other part of you is kind of scared about and everything and you did a really great job at that um and so how do you feel like that's kind of reflective of like modern dating and things like that or you know and how do your characters kind of work through getting out of their own way you know, I think that's a good question. And it's really hard to answer that because I feel like, you know, modern dating with apps and things have made it a lot more difficult because there's mm -hmm. so many more like variables at play here. Like there's like there's emojis and there's tones and like, <laughs> yeah. I, like I feel like it's really hard just to navigate that. And um, in the book, I actually don't have Rita and Milan um, use my shoddy as the app to communicate because mm -hmm. I feel like there's, I feel like, well, first of all, they should be doing a lot more communicating in the book. But <laughs> I mean, I totally get it. Like, a lot, there's a lot of like controversy around um, miscommunication as a trope. Um, but you know, I feel like it's very like realistic and very natural that you know people don't want to talk about their emotions, especially um, to an ex, for example, and tell them, "Hey, I'm still kind of hurt by what you did. Can we discuss it?" Like, yeah. I mean, nobody wants to say that. No. Like. <laughs> Nobody wants to own that. Right, like who wants, who wants to be that vulnerable and like admit that you still feel hurt by something that they did to you or that you think that they did to you. Mm -hmm. And especially, I mean, like the worst, like the worst thing ever would be like if that person was like, uh, I don't remember that. Oh, and I know, I know. <laughs> I feel like some people would just be like, um, they would just be tempted to respond that way just because they feel awkward about it, even if they totally remember. And like mm -hmm. you know how the other person's gonna respond. Cause like Rita knew him really well when they were dating in high school because they were high school sweethearts for six years. But now it's like, do I know him anymore? Do I know exactly how he's gonna respond, how he's gonna react? And it's like giant question mark. So yeah, yeah. I, I think it's just made it a lot more difficult, honestly. For sure. And I think like there's also that aspect where it was so out of the blue how she felt things ended. So then, you know, you're questioning like, do I know this person? Like I thought I did. And like, you know, that trust was broken. How can I convey all these feelings and stuff? And mm -hmm. going back to what you were saying though, about like um, online dating and stuff, I loved how you incorporated emojis into your, like into the mm -hmm. text of the book. I was like, I, I just thought that was so perfect and like so poignant too. Cause I was like, it is how we communicate. And they have so much nuance to them, <laughs> you know? Like, I can't wait to just like start seeing them in the middle of sentences and like in books because I feel like that's coming any day now. Right. Like, they communicate so much. Like, they, they speak for themselves sometimes better than actually words do. Oh, yeah. I completely like, agree. I, I feel like the laugh crying emoji, yeah, like the, like the laugh crying emoji, like, it could stand for so many things. And like, that's the one I use the most because I mean, mm -hmm. sometimes it could be like, oh, I genuinely find it funny. And on the other hand, it could be like, ha ha ha, that's really cringy. Yeah. <laughs> or it could be like, I just said something really like vulnerable. So I'm going to pretend it was a joke and like put this laughing emoji there. <laughs> oh, I do that only I put LOL at the end. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, like, that's, it's like really self-deprecating. Where it's like, yes. where I'm like really earnest, and then it's like, yeah. oh well, I didn't really mean it. 
I know, I know. You sound like just the most raw, vulnerable text. And you're like, LOL, like, want to go get pizza? <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, one thing that I loved, too, about Rita so much was um, just her passion for her career and everything. And obviously, like you said, you put so much into a lot of HGTV into, like, the research of that and everything. But can you talk a little bit about writing you know, a strong like heroine who just really loves what she does and everything like that. Yeah, so like that was really important to me because for some reason, like just like the foodiness that you find in a lot of my work, um, I, I really like having cool, unique kind of jobs, like the kind of jobs that you wouldn't like, um, like the kind of jobs that are kind of aspirational in a way. Um, <laughs> so, so like my first character in my YA debut was a barista um, Rita is obviously like a furniture restorer and a um, emerging interior designer. And like in my next book, she's a party princess. So like she dresses up as an entertainer for children's parties. And then oh my, God. my next adult book, she is an author. So be prepared for things to get very real. Oh my God. <laughs> so, oh no. Yeah, so I, I love like these really cool, unique, aspirational jobs. and. I really wanted to show a South Asian, specifically Indian character, who um, was able to pursue something creative and who was supported and encouraged by her parents every step of the way. Because I, I there's like this stereotype, you know, with a lot of like Asian people that you have to be like a doctor, a lawyer, an engineer. And I feel like we should be kind of subverting a lot of those stereotypes as well, because that's definitely not everyone's experience. and. There are like, like for, for me, for example, like I, I went to business school because I, well, I really enjoyed it for one. Um, I, I know that that's weird, but I really like numbers and I really like liked my accounting classes and everything. And it's really nerdy to admit perhaps, but. Good for you. <laughs> but I was like really convinced that, you know, this is what I want to do. I want to have like this high powered New York job. I want like a pink power suit. I want to like strut my stuff. And I mean, I, when I actually like, got towards like the end of that program i was like no i really want to write because i have been writing um seriously pretty much for all my life like i always took it seriously but i've never really thought about like publishing a book and i mean it always seemed like one of those like really glamorous things to me like a rock star a celebrity like do real people just decide one day i'm gonna get up and write a book and i mean <laughs> like like i didn't know and yeah like the closer I got to graduation, I was like writing frantically in like my spare um, minutes of time before like lectures and stuff. And I was like, well, why have I never really considered this before? And like, I told my mom that like, I'm graduating, I have to start like looking for a job and I, I really don't wanna work in business anymore. Like I love writing and that's something that's really only clarified itself to me now. And unfortunately it happened after four years of college and two years of grad school. Um, <laughs> so not maybe the greatest timing, I mean, at, at least I can do my own taxes. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> so, I mean, I really wanted to show like, and my mom was like, um, I've been telling you like your whole life to become a writer. Like I've been telling you, I've been encouraging you to do it. I've been like wanting you to do this. And like, I always think you'd be happy doing it. And it's only like in the last couple of years or so that I've realized that that hasn't been like everyone's experience that like not everyone, especially like Asian people get to hear from their parents that I support you doing this creative thing and I support and I think you'd be good at it. And I really wanted to show a character like Rita whose parents do all of that for her, because I feel like that's something that a lot of us um, or a lot of people really want from their parents, like they want that validation. And I really hope that, you know, seeing a character like Rita in this book, like, I hope that's meaningful and significant and it means something to people that they can have that representation. I I thought it was so beautiful. And like, I, I really did love how fleshed out and real and honest Rita's relationship with her parents was. And like, you really did capture that so beautifully. Like kudos to you because that was that was really wonderful. And I know um, in your book also, like Harper and Dan, like Harper is like very passionate about pulling teeth. And I love that <laughs> Goodreads like description. And um, I, I love that. Like, did you write that? Did your editor write that? Or I, I wrote that, yeah. Oh, I had a feeling. I definitely had a feeling. But I like 
Do you want to talk maybe a little bit about like how you, what was so important about Harper being that passionate and how it was with Dan being maybe not so passionate? Yeah, so um, my my debut comes out in March. This is my cover, Brush With Love. Um, and it takes place in dental school. And um, I'm finishing up my last year of dental school right now. And I wrote this during my first year. Um, and I think I was in one of those situations where I was like, I was under a lot of like stress um, and pressure. And I was kind of going through like a quarter life crisis too. Like I was like, I don't know what I want to do. Like if this is for sure what I want to do. Um, and so I was, I kind of wanted, I, in a lot of ways, I just wanted to look at two different people that, you know, one was like pursuing something that they felt so much passion and joy and like excitement for and celebrate the beauty of that. And then on the other hand, I wanted to kind of look at the, the other side of people that pursue careers and like um, different fields because of familial expectations. Um, because I feel like we just don't talk about that enough. Like a lot of people go into jobs because it's what the family does or, you know, it's like what's expected of them and stuff. Um, yeah, but I mean, Harper's like, I, I also just thought it would be really funny to, or just like neat to show a woman that had so much like drive and passion and love for kind of the goriest aspect of it mm -hmm. all because it's women are so underrepresented in that specialty. Um, yeah, so it was just really fun to play with that and to kind of put that on the page and show, just like you said, show somebody that just like, has really found what they love and honor that like because i i do think like it's how i feel about writing as well and it sounds like you feel the same too where it's like it's so fulfilling um and, and it's hard work and it's like can be awful at times but it's so fulfilling and like in that sense it's so important to protect that thing that like you're so passionate about um yeah and i i see that in rita and like you know i i hope that that's conveyed through harper <laughs> and everything yeah. like that but yeah and and that's something that i want to see and so it's like you know all the all the heroines out there where they just like love what they do or if they're in you know a crappy job like <laughs> they also kind of figure out what they want because mm -hmm. i think a lot of times we've been put in situations where we don't allow ourselves to ask that question but Right. Yeah. Um, so we have some questions from the audience that I'm going to pull up. Um, let's see. From the first spark of an idea you had for the shoddy setup, has there been any big changes to the plot? That's a good question. Yeah, I'm curious about that too. Yeah, actually, um, when I first started like outlining the story, there was um, there was a big scene I planned towards the end of act two, which is around like 75% where I had planned for like this big breakup to happen uh, publicly at their housewarming. And I mean, I really want it. I love the idea of this like big public, like humiliation in front of all your friends and family. <laughs> you know, like, writers are sadists. Like, yeah. like put that on my headstone, like Lily, Bay, <laughs> <laughs> number one sadist. But like, I, yeah, like we put our characters like through the ringer all the time. But you know, at, at, in the end, I felt like that would have been like drama for only for drama's sake. Like it didn't really serve the plot in any big way, except, you know, to be dramatic or <laughs> point mellow dramatic. And like, that's never really something you want to do. So that definitely got the chop pretty quick. And I was like, no, I'm not gonna put Rita through that. I'm not that cruel. <laughs> well, I guess so. You're only like semi sadist, I guess. <laughs> well, for like, that one, at least, like maybe like thirty five percent. Um. Oh, this is a really fun one. If Rita was asked by a character you love from another book, TV show, or movie to redesign their home, what character would they be, and how would Rita go about it? Okay, that one's really hard. Yeah. Um, that's really hard. <laughs> yeah, that's really hard. Oh man. Um or like what Disney princess would like Rita redesign their their palace? 
I feel like it'd probably be snow. Yeah, that, that's okay. Thank you for that, for your assist, Maisie. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because I was really stumped. That's a really good question, but like uh, it, it's 1030 at night and my brain is scrambled eggs, so I'm not great at thinking of my feet. Um, <laughs> Okay, so if it was Snow White, I think like Rita could really lean into that whole cottage core thing that even like oh my god, like, even that Rita is like a huge like proponent of. Like um, I'm thinking like these plaid blankets, like soft, fleecy, warm, uh, a lot of rugs. Um, I think she would just kind of focus on things that would really make Snow White feel like the house was a home, because that's something like she never really had, you know, with her stepmother in the castle and she only found in this really cute little cottage with the dwarves. And I feel like just anything that would make um, a home feel really cozy and safe would be probably how Rita would go about it. I love that. And Rita would just like be so, she, I mean, obviously she is so good at cottage core, but like, mm -hmm. I just really could see them vibing. We need to like commission fan art where Rita's like in there, you know, <laughs> renovating like different Disney, like castle theme that would be amazing <laughs> yeah that would definitely be cute yeah we yeah we need to do we need to get on that <laughs> um oh this is another good one so um you mentioned yellow flags how do you choose which ones to pick that would fit um for neil or the story and i do want to say like you did such a good job making neil really multi-dimensional because at times i really felt for him and then at other times i was like I can't stand this guy. So like, yeah, what, what yeah. yellow, what, how did you decide which ones to put in there? You know, like, it's, it's really interesting that you say that because I feel like the, it's the reception for Neil has been like really polarized mm. in, in a sense that, you know, like some people are like, oh, he wasn't that bad. Like I actually felt sorry for him. And I'm really glad that he and Rita had like that final talk and a really mature, respectful breakup. And I really like, I wish him all the best. And then there's the other side, which is like, girl, dump him already. Like, why, <laughs> why, like, why is he here? Like, get, get with Milan. Like, we want to see them get together. <laughs> so I feel like <laughs> it's been really mixed. Um, but yeah, you, you know what? Like, a lot of people, um, like, so, some, well, not a lot, maybe, but some people um, call the shoddy setup a love triangle. And I mean, to each their own, definitely. Everyone has their own definition of that. But for me personally, I feel like a love triangle is one where love is actually on the table um, for the main character between the other two characters. Mm -hmm. I feel like, you know, from the get go, Rita was very clear. Love is not what she feels for Neil. And she's not even necessarily thinking that they're gonna last that much longer because she kind of has this thing that after she broke up with Milan, all her relationships have only lasted like three months, I think. I, I, yeah, I think it's three months. And so she's not really expecting it to go like that much further because she and Neil have already gone like a little bit beyond that. So she's like, the, I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop. Like she mm -hmm. knows it's not going to be much longer. Like times of running out on like their honeymoon period. And like when we pick up at the beginning of the book, we already kind of see that happening. And like I didn't want to make Neil a villain because I feel like she shouldn't be with Milan only because Neil like proved himself to be very unworthy of her. Like mm -hmm. limbo, yeah. but like really like even lower than like the lowest. Yeah. <laughs> so like for as far as like yellow flags go, um, I, as I said, I didn't want to demonize him in any way. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like I chose things that I think a lot of us recognize in our partners, like the less, um, the less good quality is like the not helping with the washing up, maybe not helping with dinner. And like there, or like this is one of the scenes in the beginning of the book, she's sweaty. I, I, I'm sorry. I, <laughs> yeah. I'm sweaty. <laughs> but like, I love it. <laughs> like it's very true. Like she comes back from a very humid June morning walking her dogs. And Neil has just come back from a shower and she tries to go in for like a kiss. And he's kind of like backing up because he's shaved, he's showered, he's got his um, cologne on, his nice clean pressed yes. shirt. And it's like, you're sweaty, stay away. Like, I need a personal space bubble. And I mean, he's not that rude. Like, he's not that rude about it. Like, yeah. he, tries, he tries to be like very, he tries to walk down gently. But like, it's very clear he's uncomfortable and thinks that's gross. And you know, Rita didn't really think anything about it. She, she Like, she wouldn't think twice about if he was sweaty and wanted to hug her or kiss her, but like mm -hmm. she instantly felt really small. 
And I feel like that's something that, you know, is a yellow flag that a lot of people maybe relate to where like, mm -hmm. there's, there's like a disconnect between partners about what's okay, what's not okay, even if it's something really small. Or like he criticizes her for like unintentionally, like still in a nice way where she's making nachos like um, a few chapters into the book and she's like chopping the avocado and she's gonna sprinkle it all over the tips. And he, he's like, um, well, why didn't you make it like actual guacamole? Like why didn't you actually like, make the guacamole? And she's like, well, I'm the one who made it. So I made it the way I want to make it. And it's just easier to chop it. Like, I'm not going to like make yeah. a whole different dish for it. Yeah. And like, he, he didn't really get, you know, that she was mad about his comment. And so I feel like these are like yellow flags where it's like on their own, not like none of them are make him irredeemable on their own. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, like they add up and they like tell Rita and tell the reader that, you know, things aren't perfect in paradise yeah and and again like I really do think it was one of the more nuanced characters where I like went back and forth and was like he okay is he that bad and I'm like oh my god he sucks and I'm like oh maybe he's not yeah you really did a great job like he didn't feel like caricature at all or anything like it really he did show he you know he was just like a really dynamic character like all your other characters so you really nailed it <laughs> um and then, oh, I, I like this one a lot too. Was your writing process any different from writing a YA novel and an adult novel? Did you have to do anything to get into different writing headspaces? Um, well, for my first novel, which came out in 2019, um, which I'd actually like written well before that, like years before that, um, for that one, the character was uh, recently graduated from high school. So she was already 19 years old. She was living very independently. She had her own job. She loved where she lived. Like she wasn't one of those teenagers that really wanted to escape their hometown and go somewhere else. She really loved where she was and she had a job she adored and she had friends she adored. And I feel like she was more emotionally mature maybe than a lot of um, fresh high school graduates are. Mm -hmm. So compared to writing the shoddy setup um, just last year, I feel like there weren't too many differences, although of, of course between YA and adult, like there are obvious differences. I think the fact that my first book was upper YA uh, gave me a lot more um, freedom to have the characters be a little bit more adult just because, you know, they were all over 18. Mm -hmm. And, you know, be, with writing adult, you don't need to like ask your parents, hey, can I go out? Like, is it okay if I take the car or I need a ride? Um, like they have the freedom to do what they want and not ask for permission to do anything. And so with my next YA, the characters are 16 and 17 years old. So that is very different. Um, so writing that has been a lot more like teen, like authentic, like hopefully authentically teen, um, in the sense that, you know, I have to be very aware that like, wh while I can pretty much do whatever I want, like that's not true for these characters and it's not true for you know like teenagers in general like there's definitely like limitations to what they can do and so that book has been very different and i wouldn't say um it would be it was difficult getting into the headspace because i kind of feel like what i i feel like my books probably do have a pretty good crossover in the sense that even my adult books while they are like obviously over 18 they are very much like still um I'm not quite on the cusp of true adulthood, mm -hmm. sense, but you know, they might be living on their own. They might be having um, like actual, like real world jobs, but at the same time, they're not quite sure of hundred percent of who they are yet or what they want out of life. And I feel like that's something, you know, a lot of teenagers can also relate to. So I feel like I, I so I, I hope anyway, that, you know, I do have a really good crossover and that the readers who enjoy my adult, um, could also check out my YA as well. Yeah, I don't, I don't think there will be any problem there. Yeah, I think like, I think that's kind of what's interesting about being in your 20s too, where especially now, like, there's so much that's still up in the air. And I feel like people are just starting to finally admit it. Like, we have no idea what we're doing. We're just like teenagers and mm -hmm. like bigger bodies that hurt more. <laughs> and so I do think that there's like a good crossover there. So that's wonderful. Um, and then this kind of 
follows with that. Um, given this is your second book, what did you learn throughout the process um, of this as your second that you didn't previously for the first one as an author? Um, I have definitely learned to appreciate the art of uh, plotting. Um, okay. I know there's like this huge uh, debate about plotting versus pantsing. Mm -hmm. And I used to be very much in the former camp where like I would write by the seat of my pants. I did not plan a whole lot in the beginning. I, I kind of just had the, the spark of an idea and I'd run with it. And then, you know, as these things usually do, like around 20, 30 K, that's when like the shininess kind of wears off. And then you realize that it's work and that you have to do it. And oh my God, I have to somehow make it to 80,000 words. <laughs> and do, do I love it enough to keep going or like are self doubts creeping in? Um, so like, I, I definitely like before I first got published, I had a lot of books that kind of fizzled out around that 20 or 30 K mark because I hadn't plotted it out. Like I didn't know where the story was going. I only knew how it started and I usually didn't even know how it ended. And like running with it is great for a discovery draft, especially like if you plan to do like multiple revisions. But I usually like to try to get my first draft as, um, I like to get that foundation set right in the first draft. So I figured out like what works for me is I really do need some kind of plotting. And mm -hmm. so I sat down to plot this and then I felt, oh my gosh, like I feel like I've given way too much information and it's lost the magic of the story. and. I feel like there's nothing new for me to discover. So then I kind of played around. I looked up a lot of like um, like other authors, what they did, what they recommended. And I kind of like Frankenstein my own version together of like what I know I need in order to start a book and see it through. And to like um, the the short version is basically, I know how, I always need to know what, how it starts and how it ends. And I usually have like five to seven of the big plot beats in between. And I feel like as long as I know what those big moments are, the smaller stuff I can pants along the way, and you know, I'll, I'll get I'll get there eventually. But it's okay if I meander along the way, like just for my own discovery process, just so it feels a little bit less rigid. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And yeah, I think I like. Do you write in order? I do. I I, okay. I I can't not write in order. I don't know what it is. Maybe I have a very linear way of thinking. Um, like I know people say like, oh, if you can't write your next scene and just like make a little note or put it in a bracket and move on. And like, I know this is really, really like effective for fast drafting, but I, I did it once and I tried to move on. And then I like hit delete and then I deleted the note that I made in the bracket. <laughs> and I, <laughs> I can't do it. I can't do it. No We're done. We're done yeah. here. <laughs> I gave up like 10 seconds in and I was like, no, I can't. Oh my God. That's funny. I love that. Um, okay. And then I think that this would probably be a really nice one. Well, you kind of already answered it. Um, out of like all the books that you've written, even the ones that you're kind of drafting right now, is there like one scene that you have that has just like brought you the most joy to write? Mm, probably the scene where Rita and Milan get together at the end, because I feel like that was where in a second chance romance, like you you probably know going in if you are a romance reader or you know anything about the genre that it's probably going to be a happy ending like it's like that's like that's like the one rule yeah. of romance like it needs to have a happy ending so i mean it's it's not like out of this world that you guess going in that they're definitely going to get together at the end um so i feel like but that's like the payoff that you're waiting for in like any romance novel but especially in second chances, because you know that there's been something that split them up in the past, and you know that it's kind of prevented them from getting together sooner in the book in the present. And you really need that like emotional satisfaction, that payoff of seeing how they worked their way back to each other. And actually, finally, you know, you get that scene where they are back together. And I mean, hopefully, like, if, if I did my job, if any author did their job, it's like a scene that 
like fills you with happiness because you really feel like they fought, they they like they made it through the wars and they found each other and made made their way back. So I mean, yeah, I would say it's that scene for me. That was one of like I I loved that scene so much and I thought it was so special and like you really did capture just like you put them through the ringer and like the emotions felt so big and strong because first love is so like you know difficult to to, to ever get over and then to like revisit revisit it and stuff and like the emotional payoff of what you created with that ending i just thought was so beautiful and, and really well executed and oh my god it's just i love this book i you it's just such a masterpiece and one of my favorites of 2021 and I think everybody should buy it. <laughs> and definitely pre-order Maisie's book, which unfortunately I do not have a copy of. Because oh, I don't know yet, but I desperately want one so I can like creepily. I, I want to creepily stroke it like that. Oh yeah, of course. Well, yeah, I can like make our book so kiss. <laughs> Look, and our books can hang out together. <laughs> I love the little like um, the little squirt of toothpaste. Oh, I know. Isn't that fun? It was yeah. so clever. Yeah. And then just again, to show off like the dogs. Oh, I love it so much. Yeah. You did a great job capturing them too. Oh my gosh. You know, I see there's a question for you. So I'm going to ask you this one. Oh, okay. Maybe if Harper met Rita during a dentist appointment, what would they talk about? And if they were looking <laughs> out, what place would it be? Well, okay. So Harper, unfortunately, would probably be one of those dentists where she's, like, talking to you while her hands are just, like, knuckle deep in your mouth. Like, I've caught myself doing that, and I, I like, stop and apologize to my patients. I'm like, I'm so sorry. I don't mean to be that person. <laughs> I'm, like, talking to you. No, I feel like Harper would really just get super jazzed about Rita's, like, um, like everything that she does and like her Instagram page and then Harper would go on and kind of like stalk her and stuff and then she'd be like take her out to coffee and she'd try to be like really cool about it and then she'd be like I just want you to explain to me in detail every single thing that you do and why you love it and like and then they would just both gush about it because they're just like little little passion babies and they just like love what they do so much so <laughs> I, I, love and I imagine I imagine that Rita doesn't have any cavities and she flosses every day, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> Let's go with that. Because <laughs> we all do. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel like a lot of that conversation might be like along the lines of, you know, Harper informing Rita of the importance of flossing and mouthwash. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Harper would be like, oh, Rita, I noticed that you have, like, your third molars that were never extracted. Like, do you want me to do that? Like, I could just, like, shuck them out real quick. And then Rita would be like, um, I think I should just go. Like, this is a little too much for me. <laughs> well, for, for what it's worth, I feel like um, Harper would definitely be Rita's favorite dentist because, <laughs> I mean, what's not, like, I... I mean, yeah, the dentist, it can be like a scary thing. Definitely. It could be like very nerve wracking and anxiety causing, but I feel like Rita would definitely kind of nerd out about the fact that when she leaves, she gets a little goodie bag of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that stuff is really important to her. Yes. It's like, and honestly, the fact that it's all kind of miniature size too, like that's yeah. the only reason I got into it. Like the tiny toothpaste and the tiny mouthwashes, like. That's the real reason. <laughs> you know, I have so many of those like saved in like my travel bag because I ha because you know before back in like the before times, I had this like idea I'd be doing a lot more traveling for like book stuff and like like just traveling for fun and like all of these would get used up. Unfortunately, my collection is only growing, <laughs> much like my TBR pile. So you and me both. <laughs> Yeah, I like, I realize every time I travel, I'm like, oh, I have like six mini toothpaste in here. I probably should just drop one off. <laughs> That's amazing. But I think we're coming to the end of the chat at this point. We're getting close to 11. Um, but I just want to say thank you so much for letting me speak with you today. And I adore your book so much. And I just, I think it's, it's truly really a masterpiece, and you did such a good job with it. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm really well, glad I'm, you made it tonight. I'm so excited. That's when I asked, 
And, you know, I adore you and I adore your book and I can't wait to scream about it more when it comes out. <laughs> Thank you. And I want to thank Maisie and Lily for joining us. This, You guys are such a treat to get to spend a Friday night with. So thank you so much. Um, you both are just like a delightful ball of like fresh air and happiness that the world needs right now. So everybody make sure you go check out the Shoddy Setup, which is out officially on shelves. Once again, cute dogs on the cover and a custom book plate and also all of the happy feels that you'll get from reading it. So thank you so much for joining us. We're going to go ahead and say good night, everyone. Have a lovely rest of your evening, and we will see you all next time. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Thank you.